7. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your invitation. Mr. Entwistle pressed his host's hand warmly. Hercule Poirot gestured hospitably to a chair by the fire. Mr. Entwistle sighed as he sat down. On one side of the room a table was laid for two. I returned from the country this morning, he said. And you have a matter on which you wish to consult me? Yes. It's a long rambling story, I'm afraid. Then we will not have it until after we have dined. George? The efficient George materialized with some pâté de foie gras accompanied by hot toast in a napkin. We will have our pâté by the fire, said Poirot. Afterwards we will move to the table. It was an hour and a half later that Mr. Entwistle stretched himself comfortably out in his chair and sighed a contented sigh. You certainly know how to do yourself well, Poirot. Trust a Frenchman. I am a Belgian. But the rest of your remark applies. At my age the chief pleasure, almost the only pleasure that still remains, is the pleasure of the table. Mercifully I have an excellent stomach. Ah, murmured Mr. Entwistle. They had dined off Sol Veronique, followed by Escalope de Vaux Milanese, proceeding to pour Flamby with ice cream. They had drunk a Paoli Fuis followed by a Corton, and a very good port now reposed at Mr. Entwistle's elbow. Poirot, who did not care for port, was sipping creme de cacao. I don't know, murmured Mr. Entwistle reminiscently. How you managed to get hold of an Escalope like that? It melted in the mouth. I have a friend who is a continental butcher. For him I solve a small domestic problem. He is appreciative, and ever since then he is most sympathetic to me in the matters of the stomach. A domestic problem, Mr. Entwistle sighed. I wish you had not reminded me. This is such a perfect moment. Prolong it, my friend. We will have presently the demitasse and the fine brandy, and then... When digestion is peacefully underway, then you shall tell why you need my advice. The clock struck the half hour after nine before Mr. Entwistle stirred in his chair. The psychological moment had come. He no longer felt reluctant to bring forth his perplexities. He was eager to do so. I don't know, he said, whether I'm making the most colossal fool of myself. In any case, I don't see that there's anything that can possibly be done. But I'd like to put the facts before you, and I'd like to know what you think. He paused for a moment or two, then in his dry meticulous way, he told his story. His trained legal brain enabled him to put the facts clearly, to leave nothing out, and to add nothing extraneous. It was a clear succinct account, and as such appreciated by the little elderly man with the egg-shaped head who sat listening to him. When he had finished there was a pause. Mr. Entwistle was prepared to answer questions, but for some few moments no question came. Hercule Poirot was reviewing the evidence. He said at last, It seems very clear. You have in your mind the suspicion that your friend, Richard Abernethy, may have been murdered? That suspicion, or assumption, rests on the basis of one thing only, the words spoken by Cora Lansconet at Richard Abernethy's funeral. Take those away, and there is nothing left. The fact that she herself was murdered the day afterwards may be the purest coincidence. It is true that Richard Abernethy died suddenly, but he was attended by a reputable doctor who knew him well, and that doctor had no suspicions and gave a death certificate. Was Richard buried or cremated? Cremated, according to his own request. Yes, that is the law. And it means that a second doctor signed the certificate, but there would be no difficulty about that. So we come back to the essential point, what Cora Lansconet said. You were there and you heard her. She said, but he was murdered, wasn't he? Yes. And the real point is, that you believe she was speaking the truth. The lawyer hesitated for a moment, then he said, Yes, I do. Why? Why? Entwistle repeated the word, slightly puzzled. But yes, why? Is it because already, deep down... You had an uneasiness about the manner of Richard's death? The lawyer shook his head. No, no, not in the least. Then it is because of her, of Cora herself. You knew her well? I had not seen her for, oh, over twenty years. Would you have known her if you had met her in the street? Mr. Entwistle reflected. I might have passed her by in the street without recognizing her.
She was a thin slip of a girl when I saw her last, and she had turned into a stout, shabby, middle-aged woman. But I think that the moment I spoke to her face to face I should have recognized her. She wore her hair in the same way, a bang cut straight across the forehead, and she had a trick of peering up at you through her fringe like a rather shy animal, and she had a very characteristic, abrupt way of talking, and a way of putting her head on one side and then coming out with something quite outrageous. She had character, you see, and character is always highly individual. She was, in fact, the same Cora you had known years ago. And she still said outrageous things. The things, the outrageous things she had said in the past, were they usually justified? That was always the awkward thing about Cora. When truth would have been better left unspoken, she spoke it. And that characteristic remained unchanged. Richard Abernethy was murdered, so Cora at once mentioned the fact. Mr. Entwistle stirred. You think he was murdered? Oh, no, no, my friend, we cannot go so fast. We agree on this. Cora thought he had been murdered. She was quite sure he had been murdered. It was, to her, more a certainty than a surmise. And so, we come to this, she must have had some reason for the belief. We agree, by your knowledge of her, that it was not just a bit of mischief-making. Now tell me, when she said what she did, there was, at once, a kind of chorus of protest, that is right? Quite right. And she then became confused, abashed, and retreated from the position, saying, as far as you can remember, something like but I thought, from what he told me. The lawyer nodded. I wish I could remember more clearly. But I am fairly sure of that. She used the words he told me or he said. And the matter was then smoothed over and everyone spoke of something else. You can remember, looking back, no special expression on anyone's face? Anything that remains in your memory as, shall we say, unusual? No. And the very next day, Cora is killed, and you ask yourself, can it be cause and effect? The lawyer stirred. I suppose that seems to you quite fantastic? Not at all, said Poirot. Given that the original assumption is correct, it is logical. The perfect murder, the murder of Richard Abernethy, has been committed, all has gone off smoothly, and suddenly it appears that there is one person who has a knowledge of the truth. Clearly that person M. U.S.T. be silenced as quickly as possible. Then you do think that, it was murder? Poirot said gravely. I think, mon cher, exactly as you thought, that there is a case for investigation. Have you taken any steps? You have spoken of these matters to the police? No. Mr. Entwistle shook his head. It did not seem to me that any good purpose could be achieved. My position is that I represent the family. If Richard Abernethy was murdered, there seems only one method by which it could be done. By poison? Exactly. And the body has been cremated. There is now no evidence available. But I decided that I, myself, must be satisfied on the point. That is why, Poirot, I have come to you. Who was in the house at the time of his death? An old butler who has been with him for years, a cook and a housemaid. It would seem, perhaps, as though it must necessarily be one of them. Ah, uh, do not try to pull the wool upon my eyes. This Cora, she knows Richard Abernethy was killed, yet she acquiesces in the hushing up. She says, I think you are all quite right. Therefore it must be one of the family who is concerned, someone whom the victim himself might prefer not to have openly accused. Otherwise, since Cora was fond of her brother, she would not agree to let the sleeping murderer lie. You agree to that, yes? It was the way I reasoned, yes, confessed Mr. Entwistle. Though how any of the family could possibly. Poirot cut him short. Where poison is concerned there are all sorts of possibilities. It must, presumably, have been a narcotic of some sort if he died in his sleep and if there were no suspicious appearances. Possibly he was already having some narcotic administered to him. In any case, said Mr. Entwistle, the how hardly matters. We shall never be able to prove anything. In the case of Richard Abernethy, no. But the murder of Cora Lanskinet is different. Once we know who then evidence ought to be possible to get, he added with a sharp glance, you have, perhaps, already done something. 
Very little. My purpose was mainly, I think, elimination. It is distasteful to me to think that one of the Abernethy family is a murderer. I still can't quite believe it. I hope that by a few apparently idle questions I could exonerate certain members of the family beyond question. Perhaps, who knows, all of them? In which case, Cora would have been wrong in her assumption, and her own death could be ascribed to some casual prowler who broke in. After all, the issue is very simple. What were the members of the Abernethy family doing on the afternoon that Cora Lansconet was killed? Eh bien, said Poirot. What were they doing? George Crossfield was at Hurst Park races. Rosamund Shane was out shopping in London. Her husband, for one must include husbands. Assuredly. Her husband was fixing up a deal about an option on a play. Susan and Gregory Banks were at home all day. Timothy Abernethy, who is an invalid, was at his home in Yorkshire, and his wife was driving herself home from Enderby. He stopped. Hercule Poirot looked at him and nodded comprehendingly. Yes, that is what they say. And is it all true? I simply don't know, Poirot. Some of the statements are capable of proof or disproof, but it would be difficult to do so without showing one's hand pretty plainly. In fact, to do so would be tantamount to an accusation. I will simply tell you certain conclusions of my own. George may have been at Hurst Park races, but I do not think he was. He was rash enough to boast that he had backed a couple of winners. It is my experience that so many offenders against the law ruin their own case by saying too much. I asked him the name of the winners, and he gave the names of two horses without any apparent hesitation. Both of them, I found, had been heavily tipped on the day in question and one had duly won. The other, though an odds-on favorite, had unaccountably failed even to get a place. Interesting. Had this George any urgent need for money at the time of his uncle's death? It is my impression that his need was very urgent. I have no evidence for saying so, but I strongly suspect that he has been speculating with his client's funds and that he was in danger of prosecution. It is only my impression, but I have some experience in these matters. Defaulting solicitors, I regret to say, are not entirely uncommon. I can only tell you that I would not have cared to entrust my own funds to George, and I suspect that Richard Abernethy, a very shrewd judge of men, was dissatisfied with his nephew and placed no reliance on him. His mother, the lawyer continued, was a good-looking rather foolish girl and she married a man of what I should call dubious character. He sighed. The Abernethy girls were not good choosers. He paused and then went on. As for Rosamund, she is a lovely nitwit. I really cannot see her smashing Cora's head in with a hatchet. Her husband, Michael Shane, is something of a dark horse. He's a man with ambition and also a man of overweening vanity, I should say. But really I know very little about him. I have no reason to suspect him of a brutal crime or of a carefully planned poisoning but until I know that he really was doing what he says he was doing I cannot rule him out. But you have no doubts about the wife? No, no, there is a certain rather startling callousness. But no, I really cannot envisage the hatchet. She is a fragile-looking creature. And beautiful, said Poirot with a faint cynical smile. And the other niece? Susan? She is a very different type from Rosamund, a girl of remarkable ability, I should say. She and her husband were at home together that day. I said falsely that I had tried to get them on the telephone on the afternoon in question. Greg said very quickly that the telephone had been out of order all day. He had tried to get someone and failed. So again it is not conclusive. You cannot eliminate as you hope to do. What is the husband like? I find him hard to make out. He has a somewhat unpleasing personality, though one cannot say exactly why he makes this impression. As for Susan. Yes? Susan reminds me of her uncle. She has the vigor, the drive, the mental capacity of Richard Abernethy. It may be my fancy that she lacks some of the kindliness and the warmth of my old friend. Women are never kind, remarked Poirot, though they can sometimes be tender. She loves her husband. Devotedly, I should say. But really, Poirot, I can't believe. I won't believe for one moment that Susan. You prefer George? Said Poirot. It is natural. 
As for me, I am not so sentimental about beautiful young ladies. Now tell me about your visit to the older generation. Mr. Entwistle described his visit to Timothy and Maud at some length. Poirot summarized the result. So Mrs. Abernethy is a good mechanic. She knows all about the inside of a car. And Mr. Abernethy is not the invalid he likes to think himself. He goes out for walks and is, according to you, capable of vigorous action. He is also a bit of an egomaniac, and he resented his brother's success and superior character. He spoke very affectionately of Cora, and ridiculed her silly remark after the funeral. What of the sixth beneficiary? Helen? Mrs. Leo? I do not suspect her for a moment. In any case, her innocence will be easy to prove. She was at Enderby, with three servants in the house. At the end, my friend, said Poirot, let us be practical. What do you want me to do? I want to know the truth, Poirot. Yes. Yes, I should feel the same in your place. And you're the man to find it out for me. I know you don't take cases anymore, but I ask you to take this one. This is a matter of business. I will be responsible for your fees. Come now, money is always useful. Poirot grinned. Not if it all goes in the taxes. But I will admit, your problem interests me. Because it is not easy. It is all so nebulous. One thing, my friend, had better be done by you. After that, I will occupy myself of everything. But I think it will be best if you yourself seek out the doctor who attended Mr. Richard Abernethy. You know him? Slightly. What is he like? Middle-aged GP quite competent. On very friendly terms with Richard. A thoroughly good fellow. Then seek him out. He will speak more freely to you than to me. Ask him about Mr. Abernethy's illness. Find out what medicines Mr. Abernethy was taking at the time of his death and before. Find out if Richard Abernethy ever said anything to his doctor about fancying himself being poisoned. By the way, this Miss Gilchrist is sure that he used the term poisoned in talking to his sister? Mr. Entwistle reflected. It was the word she used, but she is the type of witness who often changes the actual words used because she is convinced she is keeping to the sense of them. If Richard had said he was afraid someone wanted to kill him, Miss Gilchrist might have assumed poison because she connected his fears with those of an aunt of hers who thought her food was being tampered with. I can take up the point with her again sometime. Yes. Or I will do so. He paused and then said in a different voice. Has it occurred to you, my friend, that your Miss Gilchrist may be in some danger herself? Mr. Entwistle looked surprised. I can't say that it had. But yes. Cora voiced her suspicions on the day of the funeral. The question in the murderer's mind will be, did she voice them to anybody when she first heard of Richard's death? And the most likely person for her to have spoken to about them will be Miss Gilchrist. I think, mon cher, that she had better not remain alone in that cottage. I believe Susan is going down. Ah, uh, so Mrs. Banks is going down? She wants to look through Cora's things. I see. I see. Well, my friend, do what I have asked of you. You might also prepare Mrs. Abernethy, Mrs. Leo Abernethy, for the possibility that I may arrive in the house. We will see. From now on I occupy myself of everything. And Poirot twirled his mustaches with enormous energy. 8. Mr. Entwistle looked at Dr. Larrabee thoughtfully. He had had a lifetime of experience in summing people up. There had been frequent occasions on which it had been necessary to tackle a difficult situation or a delicate subject. Mr. Entwistle was an adept by now in the art of how exactly to make the proper approach. How would it be best to tackle Dr. Larrabee on what was certainly a very difficult subject and one which the doctor might very well resent as reflecting upon his own professional skill? Frankness, Mr. Entwistle thought, or at least a modified frankness. To say that suspicions had arisen because of a haphazard suggestion thrown out by a silly woman would be ill-advised. Dr. Larrabee had not known Cora. Mr. Entwistle cleared his throat and plunged bravely. I want to consult you on a very delicate matter, he said. You may be offended, but I sincerely hope not. You are a sensible man and you will realize, I'm sure, that er, uh, 
preposterous suggestion is best dealt with by finding a reasonable answer and not by condemning it out of hand. It concerns my client, the late Mr. Abernethy. I'll ask you my question flat out. Are you certain, absolutely certain, that he died what is termed a natural death? Dr. Larrabee's good-humored, rubicund middle-aged face turned in astonishment on his questioner. What on earth? Of course he did. I gave a certificate, didn't I? If I hadn't been satisfied. Mr. Entwistle cut in adroitly. Naturally, naturally. I assure you that I am not assuming anything to the contrary. But I would be glad to have your positive assurance, in face of the er, rumors that are flying around. Rumors? What rumors? One doesn't know quite how these things start, said Mr. Entwistle mendaciously. But my feeling is that they should be stopped, authoritatively, if possible. Abernethy was a sick man. He was suffering from a disease that would have proved fatal within, I should say, at the earliest, two years. It might have come much sooner. His son's death had weakened his will to live, and his powers of resistance. I admit that I did not expect his death to come so soon, or indeed so suddenly, but there are precedents, plenty of precedents. Any medical man who predicts exactly when a patient will die, or exactly how long he will live, is bound to make a fool of himself. The human factor is always incalculable. The weak have often unexpected powers of resistance, the strong sometimes succumb. I understand all that. I am not doubting your diagnosis. Mr. Abernethy was, shall we say, rather melodramatically, I'm afraid, under sentence of death. All I'm asking you is, is it quite possible that a man, knowing or suspecting that he is doomed, might of his own accord shorten that period of life? Or that someone else might do it for him? Dr. Larrabee frowned. Suicide, you mean? Abernethy wasn't a suicidal type. I see. You can assure me, medically speaking, that such a suggestion is impossible. The doctor stirred uneasily. I wouldn't use the word impossible. After his son's death life no longer held the interest for Abernethy that it had done. I certainly don't feel that suicide is likely, but I can't say that it's impossible. You are speaking from the psychological angle. When I say medically, I really meant, do the circumstances of his death make such a suggestion impossible? No, oh no. No, I can't say that. He died in his sleep, as people often do. There was no reason to suspect suicide no evidence of his state of mind. If one were to demand an autopsy every time a man who is seriously ill died in his sleep. The doctor's face was getting redder and redder. Mr. Entwistle hastened to interpose. Of course. Of course. But if there had been evidence, evidence of which you yourself were not aware? If, for instance, he had said something to someone, indicating that he was contemplating suicide? Did he? I must say it surprises me. But if it were so, my case is purely hypothetical. Could you rule out the possibility? Dr. Larrabee said slowly. No, not. I could not do that. But I say again. I should be very much surprised. Mr. Entwistle hastened to follow up his advantage. If then we assume that his death was not natural, all this is purely hypothetical. What could have caused it? What kind of a drug, I mean? Several. Some kind of a narcotic would be indicated. There was no sign of cyanosis. The attitude was quite peaceful. He had sleeping drafts or pills? Something of that kind. Yes. I had prescribed Slumbarrel, a very safe and dependable hypnotic. He did not take it every night. And he only had a small bottle of tablets at a time. Three or even four times the prescribed dose would not have caused death. In fact, I remember seeing the bottle on his washstand after his death still nearly full. What else had you prescribed for him? Various things. A medicine containing a small quantity of morphia to be taken when he had an attack of pain. Some vitamin capsules. An indigestion mixture. Mr. Entwistle interrupted. Vitamin capsules? I think I was once prescribed a course of those. Small round capsules of gelatin. Yes. Containing a dexaline. 
Could anything else have been introduced into, say, one of those capsules? Something lethal, you mean? The doctor was looking more and more surprised. But surely no man would ever. Look here, Entwistle, what are you getting at? My God, man, are you suggesting murder? I don't quite know what I'm suggesting. I just want to know what would be possible. But what evidence have you for even suggesting such a thing? I haven't any evidence, said Mr. Entwistle in a tired voice. Mr. Abernathy is dead, and the person to whom he spoke is also dead. The whole thing is rumor, vague, unsatisfactory rumor, and I want to scotch it if I can. If you tell me that no one could possibly have poisoned Abernathy in any way whatsoever, I'll be delighted. It would be a big weight off my mind, I can assure you. Dr. Larrabee got up and walked up and down. I can't tell you what you want me to tell you, he said at last. I wish I could. Of course it could have been done. Anybody could have extracted the oil from a capsule and replaced it with, say, pure nicotine or half a dozen other things. Or something could have been put in his food or drink. Isn't that more likely? Possibly. But you see, there were only the servants in the house when he died, and I don't think it was any of them. In fact, I'm quite sure it wasn't. So I'm looking for some delayed action possibility. There's no drug, I suppose, that you can administer, and then the person dies weeks later? A convenient idea, but untenable, I'm afraid, said the doctor drilly. I know you're a reasonable person, Entwistle, but who is making this suggestion? It seems to me wildly far-fetched. Abernathy never said anything to you? Never hinted that one of his relations might be wanting him out of the way? The doctor looked at him curiously. No, he never said anything to me. Are you sure, Entwistle, that somebody hasn't been, well, playing up the sensational? Some hysterical subjects can give an appearance of being quite reasonable and normal, you know. I hope it was like that. It might well be. Let me understand. Someone claims that Abernathy told her, it was a woman, I suppose. Oh yes, it was a woman. Told her someone was trying to kill him? Cornered, Mr. Entwistle reluctantly told the tale of Cora's remark at the funeral. Dr. Larrabee's face lightened. My dear fellow, I shouldn't pay any attention. The explanation is quite simple. The woman's at a certain time of life, craving for sensation, unbalanced, unreliable, might say anything. They do, you know. Mr. Entwistle resented the doctor's easy assumption. He himself had had to deal with plenty of sensation hunting and hysterical women. You may be quite right, he said, rising. Unfortunately, we can't tackle her on the subject, as she's been murdered herself. What's that, murdered? Dr. Larrabee looked as though he had grave suspicions of Mr. Entwistle's own stability of mind. You've probably read about it in the paper. Mrs. Lanskinet at Lichet St. Mary in Berkshire. Of course, I'd no idea she was a relation of Richard Abernathy's. Dr. Larrabee was looking quite shaken, feeling that he had revenged himself for the doctor's professional superiority, and unhappily conscious that his own suspicions had not been assuaged as a result of the visit, Mr. Entwistle took his leave. Back at Enderby, Mr. Entwistle decided to talk to Lanscombe. He started by asking the old butler what his plans were. Mrs. Leo has asked me to stay on here until the house is sold, sir, and I'm sure I shall be very pleased to oblige her. We are all very fond of Mrs. Leo, he sighed. I feel it very much, sir, if you will excuse me mentioning it, that the house has to be sold. I've known it for so very many years, and seen all the young ladies and gentlemen grow up in it. I always thought that Mr. Mortimer would come here after his father and perhaps bring up a family here, too. It was arranged, sir, that I should go to the North Lodge when I got past doing my work here. A very nice little place, the North Lodge, and I looked forward to having it very spick and span. But I suppose that's all over now. I'm afraid so, Lanscombe. The estate will have to be sold together. But with your legacy. Oh, I'm not complaining, sir and I'm very sensible of Mr. Abernathy's generosity. I'm well provided for, but it's not so easy to find a little place to buy nowadays, and though my married niece has asked me to make my home with them, well, it won't be quite the same thing as living on the estate. I know, said Mr. Entwistle. 
It's a hard new world for us old fellows. I wish I'd seen more of my old friend before he went. How did he seem those last few months? Well, he wasn't himself, sir, not since Mr. Mortimer's death. No, it broke him up. And then he was a sick man. Sick men have strange fancies sometimes. I imagine Mr. Abernethy suffered from that sort of thing in his last days. He spoke of enemies sometimes, of somebody wishing to do him harm, perhaps? He may even have thought his food was being tampered with. Old Lanscombe looked surprised, surprised and offended. I cannot recall anything of that kind, sir. Entwistle looked at him keenly. You're a very loyal servant, Lanscombe, I know that. But such fancies on Mr. Abernethy's part would be quite, er, unimportant, a natural symptom in some, er, diseases. Indeed, sir? I can only say Mr. Abernethy never said anything like that to me, or in my hearing. Mr. Entwistle slid gently to another subject. He had some of his family down to stay with him, didn't he, before he died? His nephew and his two nieces and their husbands? Yes, sir, that is so. Was he satisfied with those visits? Or was he disappointed? Lanscombe's eyes became remote, his old back stiffened. I really could not say, sir. I think you could, you know, said Mr. Entwistle gently. It's not your place to say anything of that kind, that's what you really mean. But there are times when one has to do violence to one's senses of what is fitting. I was one of your master's oldest friends. I cared for him very much. So did you. That's why I'm asking you for your opinion as a man, not as a butler. Lanscombe was silent for a moment, then he said in a colorless voice, Is there anything wrong, sir? Mr. Entwistle replied truthfully, I don't know, he said. I hope not. I would like to make sure. Have you felt yourself that something was wrong? Only since the funeral, sir. And I couldn't say exactly what it is. But Mrs. Leo and Mrs. Timothy, too, they didn't seem quite themselves that evening after the others had gone. You know the contents of the will? Yes, sir. Mrs. Leo thought I would like to know. It seemed to me, if I may permit myself to comment, a very farewell. Yes, it was a farewell. Equal benefits. But it is not, I think, the will that Mr. Abernethy originally intended to make after his son died. Will you answer now the question that I asked you just now? As a matter of personal opinion. Yes, yes, that is understood. The master, sir, was very much disappointed after Mr. George had been here. He had hoped, I think, that Mr. George might resemble Mr. Mortimer. Mr. George, if I may say so, did not come up to standard. Miss Laura's husband was always considered unsatisfactory, and I'm afraid Mr. George took after him. Lanscombe paused and then went on. Then the young ladies came with their husbands. Miss Susan he took to at once, a very spirited and handsome young lady, but it's my opinion he couldn't abide her husband. Young ladies make funny choices nowadays, sir. And the other couple? I couldn't say much about that. A very pleasant and good-looking young pair. I think the master enjoyed having them here, but I don't think. The old man hesitated. Yes, Lanscombe? Well, the master had never been much struck with the stage. He said to me one day, I can't understand why anyone gets stage struck. It's a foolish kind of life. Seems to deprive people of what little sense they have. I don't know what it does to your moral sense. You certainly lose your sense of proportion. Of course he wasn't referring directly. No, no, I quite understand. Now, after these visits... Mr. Abernethy himself went away, first to his brother, and afterwards to his sister Mrs. Lanskinet. That I did not know, sir. I mean he mentioned to me that he was going to Mr. Timothy, and afterwards to something St. Mary. That is right. Can you remember anything he said on his return in regard to those visits? Lanscombe reflected. I really don't know, nothing direct. He was glad to be back. Traveling and staying in strange houses tired him very much, that I do remember his saying. Nothing else? Nothing about either of them? Lanscombe frowned. The master used to, well, to murmur, if you get my meaning, speaking to me and yet more to himself, hardly noticing I was there, because he knew me so well. 
knew you and trusted you, yes? But my recollection is very vague as to what he said, something about he couldn't think what he'd done with his money. That was Mr. Timothy, I take it. And then he said something about, women can be fools in ninety-nine different ways but be pretty shrewd in the hundredth. Oh yes, and he said, you can only say what you really think to someone of your own generation. They don't think you're fancying things as the younger ones do. And later he said, but I don't know in what connection, it's not very nice to have to set traps for people, but I don't see what else I can do. But I think it possible, sir, that he may have been thinking of the second gardener, a question of the peaches being taken. But Mr. Entwistle did not think that it was the second gardener who had been in Richard Abernethy's mind. After a few more questions he let Lanscombe go and reflected on what he had learned. Nothing really, nothing, that is, that he had not deduced before. Yet there were suggestive points. It was not his sister-in-law, Maud, but his sister Cora of whom he had been thinking when he made the remark about women who were fools and yet shrewd. And it was to her that he had confided his fancies. And he had spoken of setting a trap. For whom? Mr. Entwistle had meditated a good deal over how much he should tell Helen. In the end he decided he should take her wholly into his confidence. First he thanked her for sorting out Richard's things and for making various household arrangements. The house had been advertised for sale and there were one or two prospective buyers who would shortly be coming to look over it. Private buyers? I'm afraid not. The YWCA are considering it, and there is a young people's club, and the trustees of the Jefferson Trust are looking for a suitable place to house their collection. It seems sad that the house will not be lived in, but of course it is not a practicable proposition nowadays. I am going to ask you if it would be possible for you to remain here until the house is sold. Or would it be a great inconvenience? No, actually it would suit me very well. I don't want to go to Cyprus until May, and I much prefer being here than being in London as I had planned. I love this house, you know, Leo loved it, and we were always happy when we were here together. There is another reason why I should be grateful if you would stay on. There is a friend of mine, a man called Hercule Poirot. Helen said sharply. Hercule Poirot? Then you think. You know of him? Yes. Some friends of mine. But I imagine that he was dead long ago. He is very much alive. Not young, of course. No, he could hardly be young. She spoke mechanically. Her face was white and strained. She said with an effort. You think that Cora was rig? H.T.? That Richard was murdered? Mr. Entwistle unburdened himself. It was a pleasure to unburden himself to Helen with her clear, calm mind. When he had finished, she said, One ought to feel it's fantastic, but one doesn't. Maud and I, that night after the funeral, it was in both our minds, I'm sure saying to ourselves what a silly woman Cora was, and yet being uneasy. And then, Cora was killed, and I told myself it was just coincidence, and of course it may be, but oh, if one can only be sure. It's all so difficult. Yes, it's difficult. But Poirot is a man of great originality, and he has something really approaching genius. He understands perfectly what we need, assurance that the whole thing is a mare's nest. And suppose it isn't? What makes you say that? Asked Mr. Entwistle sharply. I don't know. I've been uneasy. Not just about what Cora said that day, something else. Something that I felt at the time to be wrong. Wrong? In what way? That's just it. I don't know. You mean it was something about one of the people in the room? Yes, yes, something of that kind. But I don't know who or what. Oh, that sounds absurd. Not at all. It is interesting, very interesting. You are not a fool, Helen. If you notice something, that something has significance. Yes, but I can't remember what it was. The more I think. Don't think. That is the wrong way to bring anything back. Let it go. Sooner or later it will flash into your mind. And when it does, let me know, at once. I will. Thank you.
nine. Miss Gilchrist pulled her black hat down firmly on her head and tucked in a wisp of gray hair. The inquest was set for twelve o'clock, and it was not quite twenty past eleven. Her gray coat and skirt looked quite nice, she thought, and she had bought herself a black blouse. She wished she could have been all in black, but that would have been far beyond her means. She looked round the small neat bedroom and at the walls hung with representations of Brixham Harbor, Cockington Forge, Anstey's Cove, Cayenne's Cove, Paul Flexen Harbor, Babacombe Bay, etc., all signed in a dashing way, Cora Lanskinet. Her eyes rested with particular fondness on Paul Flexen Harbor. On the chest of drawers a faded photograph carefully framed represented the Willow Tree Tea Shop. Miss Gilchrist looked at it lovingly and sighed. She was disturbed from her reverie by the sound of the doorbell below. Dear me, murmured Miss Gilchrist. I wonder who. She went out of her room and down the rather rickety stairs. The bell sounded again and there was a sharp knock. For some reason Miss Gilchrist felt nervous. For a moment or two her steps slowed up, then she went rather unwillingly to the door, adjuring herself not to be so silly. A young woman dressed smartly in black and carrying a small suitcase was standing on the step. She noticed the alarmed look on Miss Gilchrist's face and said quickly, Miss Gilchrist? I am Mrs. Lanskinet's niece, Susan Banks. Oh dear, yes, of course. I didn't know. Do come in, Mrs. Banks. Mind the hall stand. It sticks out a little. In here, yes. I didn't know you were coming down for the inquest. I'd have had something ready, some coffee or something. Susan Banks said briskly. I don't want anything. I'm so sorry if I startled you. Well, you know you did in a way. It's very silly of me. I'm not usually nervous. In fact, I told the lawyer that I wasn't nervous, and that I wouldn't be nervous staying on here alone, and really I'm not nervous. Only, perhaps it's just the inquest and, and thinking of things. But I have been jumpy all this morning. Just about half an hour ago the bell rang and I could hardly bring myself to open the door, which was really very stupid and so unlikely that a murderer would come back. And why should he? And actually it was only a nun, collecting for an orphanage. And I was so relieved I gave her two shillings although I'm not a Roman Catholic and indeed have no sympathy with the Roman Church and all these. Monks and nuns although I believe the little sisters of the poor really do good work. But do please sit down, Mrs. Mrs. Banks. Yes, of course, Banks. Did you come down by train? No, I drove down. The lane seemed so narrow I ran the car on a little way and found a sort of old quarry I backed it into. This lane is very narrow, but there's hardly ever any traffic along here. It's rather a lonely road. Miss Gilchrist gave a little shiver as she said those last words. Susan Banks was looking round the room. Per old Aunt Cora, she said. She left what she had to me, you know. Yes, I know. Mr. Entwistle told me. I expect you'll be glad of the furniture. You're newly married, I understand, and furnishing is such an expense nowadays. Mrs. Lanskinet had some very nice things. Susan did not agree. Cora had had no taste for the antique. The contents varied between modernistic pieces and the arty type. I shan't want any of the furniture, she said. I've got my own, you know. I shall put it up for auction. Unless, is there any of it you would like? I'd be very glad. She stopped, a little embarrassed. But Miss Gilchrist was not at all embarrassed. She beamed. Now really, that's very kind of you, Mrs. Banks. Yes, very kind indeed. I really do appreciate it. But actually, you know, I have my own things. I put them in store in case, some day, I should need them. There are some pictures my father left too. I had a small tea shop at one time, you know, but then the war came. It was all very unfortunate. But I didn't sell up everything, because I did hope to have my own little home again one day. So I put the best things in store with my father's pictures and some relics of our old home. But I would like very much, if you really wouldn't mind, to have that little painted tea table of dear Mrs. Lansconet's. Such a pretty thing and we always had tea on it. Susan, looking with a slight shudder at a small green table painted with large purple clematis.
said quickly that she would be delighted for Miss Gilchrist to have it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Banks. I feel a little greedy. I've got all her beautiful pictures, you know, and a lovely amethyst brooch, but I feel that perhaps I ought to give that back to you. No, no, indeed. You'll want to go through her things? After the inquest, perhaps? I thought I'd stay here a couple of days, go through things, and clear everything up. Sleep here, you mean? Yes. Is there any difficulty? Oh no, Mrs. Banks, of course not. I'll put fresh sheets on my bed, and I can doss down here on the couch quite well. But there's Aunt Cora's room, isn't there? I can sleep in that. You, you wouldn't mind? You mean because she was murdered there? Oh no, I wouldn't mind. I'm very tough, Miss Gilchrist. It's been, I mean, it's all right again. Miss Gilchrist understood the question. Oh yes, Mrs. Banks. All the blankets sent away to the cleaners and Mrs. Panter, and I scrubbed the whole room out thoroughly. And there are plenty of spare blankets. But come up and see for yourself. She led the way upstairs and Susan followed her. The room where Cora Lanskinet had died was clean and fresh and curiously devoid of any sinister atmosphere. Like the sitting room it contained a mixture of modern utility and elaborately painted furniture. It represented Cora's cheerful tasteless personality. Over the mantelpiece an oil painting showed a buxom young woman about to enter her bath. Susan gave a slight shudder as she looked at it and Miss Gilchrist said, That was painted by Mrs. Lanskinet's husband. There a re a lot more of his pictures in the dining room downstairs. How terrible. Well, I don't care very much for that style of painting myself, but Mrs. Lansconet was very proud of her husband as an artist and thought that his work was sadly unappreciated. Where are Aunt Cora's own pictures? In my room. Would you like to see them? Miss Gilchrist displayed her treasures proudly. Susan remarked that Aunt Cora seemed to have been fond of seacoast resorts. Oh, yes. You see, she lived for many years with Mr. Lanskinet at a small fishing village in Brittany. Fishing boats are always so picturesque, are they not? Obviously, Susan murmured. A whole series of picture postcards could, she thought, have been made from Cora Lanskinet's paintings which were faithful to detail and very highly colored. They gave rise to the suspicion that they might actually have been painted from picture postcards but when she hazarded this opinion Miss Gilchrist was indignant. Mrs. Lanskinet always painted from nature. Indeed, once she had had a touch of the sun from reluctance to leave a subject when the light was just right. Mrs. Lanskinet was a real artist, said Miss Gilchrist reproachfully. She glanced at her watch and Susan said quickly, Yes, we ought to start for the inquest. Is it far? Shall I get the car? It was only five minutes' walk, Miss Gilchrist assured her. So they set out together on foot. Mr. Entwistle, who had come down by train, met them and shepherded them into the village hall. There seemed to be a large number of strangers present. The inquest was not sensational. There was evidence of the identification of the deceased. Medical evidence as to the nature of the wounds that had killed her. There were no signs of a struggle. Deceased was probably under a narcotic at the time she was attacked and would have been taken quite unawares. Death was unlikely to have occurred later than 4.30. Between 2 and 4.30 was the nearest approximation. Miss Gilchrist testified to finding the body. A police constable and Inspector Morton gave their evidence. The coroner summed up briefly. The jury made no bones about the verdict. Murder by some person or persons unknown. It was over. They came out again into the sunlight. Half a dozen cameras clicked. Mr. Entwistle shepherded Susan and Miss Gilchrist into the King's Arms, where he had taken the precaution to arrange for lunch to be served in a private room behind the bar. Not a very good lunch, he said apologetically, but the lunch was not at all bad. Miss Gilchrist sniffed a little and murmured that. It was all so dreadful but cheered up and tackled the Irish stew with appetite after Mr. Entwistle had insisted on her drinking a glass of sherry. He said to Susan, I had no idea you were coming down today, Susan. We could have come together. I know I said I wouldn't, but it seemed rather mean for none of the family to be there. 
I rang up George but he said he was very busy and couldn't possibly make it, and Rosamund had an audition and Uncle Timothy, of course, is a crock. So it had to be me. Your husband didn't come with you. Greg had to settle up with his tiresome shop. Seeing a startled look in Miss Gilchrist's eye, Susan said, My husband works in a chemist's shop. A husband in retail trade did not quite square with Miss Gilchrist's impression of Susan's smartness, but she said valiantly, Oh yes, just like Keats. Greg's no poet, said Susan. She added, We've got great plans for the future, a double-barreled establishment, cosmetics and beauty parlor and a laboratory for special preparations. That will be much nicer, said Miss Gilchrist approvingly. Something like Elizabeth Arden who is really a countess, so I have been told, or is that Helena Rubinstein? In any case, she added kindly, a pharmacist is not in the least like an ordinary shop, a draper, for instance, or a grocer. You kept a tea shop, you said, didn't you? Yes, indeed. Miss Gilchrist's face lit up. That the willow tree had ever been trade, in the sense that a shop was trade, would never have occurred to her. To keep a tea shop was in her mind the essence of gentility. She started telling Susan about the willow tree. Mr. Entwistle, who had heard about it before, let his mind drift to other matters. When Susan had spoken to him twice without his answering he hurriedly apologized. Forgive me, my dear, I was thinking, as a matter of fact, about your Uncle Timothy. I am a little worried. About Uncle Timothy? I shouldn't be. I don't believe really there's anything the matter with him. He's just a hypochondriac. Yes, yes, you may be right. I confess it was not his health that was worrying me. It's Mrs. Timothy. Apparently she's fallen downstairs and twisted her ankle. She's laid up and your uncle is in a terrible state. Because he'll have to look after her instead of the other way about. Do him a lot of good, said Susan. Yes, yes, I dare say. But will your poor aunt get any looking after? That is really the question. With no servants in the house? Life is really hell for elderly people, said Susan. They live in a kind of Georgian manor house, don't they? Mr. Entwistle nodded. They came rather warily out of the king's arms, but the press seemed to have dispersed. A couple of reporters were lying in wait for Susan by the cottage door. Shepherded by Mr. Entwistle, she said a few necessary and noncommittal words. Then she and Miss Gilchrist went into the cottage and Mr. Entwistle returned to the king's arms where he had booked a room. The funeral was to be on the following day. My car's still in the quarry, said Susan. I'd forgotten about it. I'll drive it along to the village later, Miss Gilchrist said anxiously. Not too late. You won't go out after dark, will you? Susan looked at her and laughed. You don't think there's a murderer still hanging about, do you? No, no, I suppose not. Miss Gilchrist looked embarrassed. But it's exactly what she does think, thought Susan. How amazing. Miss Gilchrist had vanished towards the kitchen. I'm sure you'd like tea early. In about half an hour, do you think, Mrs. Banks? Susan thought that tea at half past three was overdoing it, but she was charitable enough to realize that. A nice cup of tea was Miss Gilchrist's idea of restoration for the nerves and she had her own reasons for wishing to please Miss Gilchrist, so she said, Whenever you like, Miss Gilchrist. A happy clatter of kitchen implements began and Susan went into the sitting room. She had only been there a few minutes when the bell sounded and was succeeded by a very precise little rat-tat-tat. Susan came out into the hall and Miss Gilchrist appeared at the kitchen door wearing an apron and wiping flowery hands on it. Oh dear, who do you think that can be? More reporters, I expect, said Susan. Oh dear, how annoying for you, Mrs. Banks. Oh well, never mind, I'll attend to it. I was just going to make a few scones for tea. Susan went towards the front door and Miss Gilchrist hovered uncertainly. Susan wondered whether she thought a man with a hatchet was waiting outside. The visitor, however, proved to be an elderly gentleman who raised his hat when Susan opened the door and said, beaming at her in avuncular style, Mrs. Banks, I think? Yes. My name is Guthrie, Alexander Guthrie. I was a friend, a very old friend, 
of Mrs. Lanskinitz. You, I think, are her niece, formerly Miss Susan Abernethy? That's quite right. Then since we know who we are, I may come in. Of course. Mr. Guthrie wiped his feet carefully on the mat, stepped inside, divested himself of his overcoat, laid it down with his hat on a small oak chest and followed Susan into the sitting room. This is a melancholy occasion, said Mr. Guthrie, to whom melancholy did not seem to come naturally, his own inclination being to beam. Yes, a very melancholy occasion. I was in this part of the world and I felt the least I could do was to attend the inquest, and of course the funeral. Poor Cora, poor foolish Cora. I have known her, my dear Mrs. Banks, since the early days of her marriage. A high-spirited girl, and she took art very seriously, took Pierre Lansconet seriously, too, as an artist, I mean. All things considered, he didn't make her too bad a husband. He strayed, if you know what I mean, yes, he strayed. But fortunately, Cora took it as part of the artistic temperament. He was an artist and therefore immoral. In fact, I'm not sure she didn't go further. He was immoral and therefore he must be an artist. No kind of sense in artistic matters, per Cora. Though in other ways, mind you, Cora had a lot of sense. Yes, a surprising lot of sense. That's what everybody seems to say, said Susan. I didn't really know her. No, no, cut herself off from her family because they didn't appreciate her precious Pierre. She was never a pretty girl, but she had something. She was good company. You never knew what she'd say next and you never knew if her naivete was genuine or whether she was doing it deliberately. She made us all laugh a good deal. The eternal child, that's what we always felt about her. And really the last time I saw her, I have seen her from time to time since Pierre died. She struck me as still behaving very much like a child. Susan offered Mr. Guthrie a cigarette, but the old gentleman shook his head. No thank you, my dear. I don't smoke. You must wonder why I've come. To tell you the truth, I was feeling rather conscience-stricken. I promised Cora to come and see her some weeks ago. I usually called upon her once a year, and just lately she'd taken up the hobby of buying pictures at local sales and wanted me to look at some of them. My profession is that of art crit. I see you know. Of course most of Cora's purchases were horrible daubs, but take it all in all, it isn't such a bad speculation. Pictures go for next to nothing at these country sales and the frames alone are worth more than you pay for the picture. Naturally any important sale is attended by dealers and one isn't likely to get hold of masterpieces. But only the other day, a small quip was knocked down for a few pounds at a farmhouse sale. The history of it was quite interesting. It had been given to an old nurse by the family she had served faithfully for many years. They had no idea of its value. Old nurse gave it to a farmer nephew who liked the horse in it but thought it was a dirty old thing. Yes, yes, these things sometimes happen, and Cora was convinced that she had an eye for pictures. She hadn't, of course. Wanted me to come and look at a Rembrandt she had picked up last year. A Rembrandt. Not even a respectable copy of one. But she had got hold of a quite nice Bartolozzi engraving, damp spotted unfortunately. I sold it for her for thirty pounds and of course that spurred her on. She wrote to me with great gusto about an Italian primitive she had bought at some sale and I promised I'd come along and see it. That's it over there, I expect, said Susan, gesturing to the wall behind him. Mr. Guthrie got up, put on a pair of spectacles, and went over to study the picture. Poor dear Cora, he said at last. There are a lot more, said Susan. Mr. Guthrie proceeded to a leisurely inspection of the art treasures acquired by the hopeful Mrs. Lansconet. Occasionally he said, TCHK, TCHK. Occasionally he sighed. Finally he removed his spectacles. Dirt, he said, is a wonderful thing, Mrs. Banks. It gives a patina of romance to the most horrible examples of the painter's art. I'm afraid that Bartolazzi was beginner's luck. Poor Cora. Still, it gave her an interest in life. I am really thankful that I did not have to disillusion her. There are some pictures in the dining room, said Susan, but I think they are all her husband's work. Mr. Guthrie shuddered slightly and held up a protesting hand. Do not force me to look at those again, 
life classes have much to answer for. I always tried to spare Cora's feelings. A devoted wife, a very devoted wife. Well, dear Mrs. Banks, I must not take up more of your time. Oh, do stay and have some tea. I think it's nearly ready. That is very kind of you. Mr. Guthrie sat down again promptly. I'll just go and see. In the kitchen, Miss Gilchrist was just lifting a last batch of scones from the oven. The tea tray stood ready and the kettle was just gently rattling its lid. There's a Mr. Guthrie here, and I've asked him to stay for tea. Mr. Guthrie? Oh, yes, he was a great friend of dear Mrs. Lanskinet's. He's the celebrated art critic. How fortunate. I've made a nice lot of scones and that's some homemade strawberry jam, and I just whipped up some little drop cakes. I'll just make the tea. I've warmed the pot. Oh, please, Mrs. Banks, don't carry that heavy tray. I can manage everything. However, Susan took in the tray and Miss Gilchrist followed with teapot and kettle, greeted Mr. Guthrie, and they set to. Hot scones, that is a treat, said Mr. Guthrie. And what delicious jam! Really, the stuff one buys nowadays. Miss Gilchrist was flushed and delighted. The little cakes were excellent, and so were the scones, and everyone did justice to them. The ghost of the willow tree hung over the party. Here, it was clear, Miss Gilchrist was in her element. Well, thank you, perhaps I will, said Mr. Guthrie as he accepted the last cake, pressed upon him by Miss Gilchrist. I do feel rather guilty, though, enjoying my tea here, where poor Cora was so brutally murdered. Miss Gilchrist displayed an unexpected Victorian reaction to this. Oh, but Mrs. Lansconette would have wished you to take a good tea. You've got to keep your strength up. Yes, yes, perhaps you are right. The fact is, you know, that one cannot really bring oneself to believe that someone you knew, actually knew, can have been murdered. I agree, said Susan. It just seems fantastic. And certainly not by some casual tramp who broke in and attacked her. I can imagine, you know, reasons why Cora might have been murdered. Susan said quickly. Can you? What reasons? Well, she wasn't discreet, said Mr. Guthrie. Cora was never discreet. And she enjoyed, how shall I put it, showing how sharp she could be. Like a child who's got hold of somebody's secret. If Cora got hold of a secret she'd want to talk about it. Even if she promised not to, she'd still do it. She wouldn't be able to help herself. Susan did not speak. Miss Gilchrist did not either. She looked worried. Mr. Guthrie went on. Yes, a little dose of arsenic in a cup of tea. That would not have surprised me, or a box of chocolates by post. But sordid robbery and assault, that seems highly incongruous. I may be wrong, but I should have thought she had very little to take that would be worth a burglar's while. She didn't keep much money in the house, did she? Miss Gilchrist said. Very little. Mr. Guthrie sighed and rose to his feet. Ah, uh, well, there's a lot of lawlessness about since the war. Times have changed. Thanking them for the tea he took a polite farewell of the two women. Miss Gilchrist saw him out and helped him on with his overcoat. From the window of the sitting room, Susan watched him trot briskly down the front path to the gate. Miss Gilchrist came back into the room with a small parcel in her hand. The postman must have been while we were at the inquest. He pushed it through the letter box, and it had fallen in the corner behind the door. Now I wonder why, of course, it must be wedding cake. Happily Miss Gilchrist ripped off the paper. Inside was a small white box tied with silver ribbon. It is. She pulled off the ribbon. Inside was a modest wedge of rich cake with almond paste and white icing. How nice! Now who? She consulted the card attached. John and Mary. Now who can that be? How silly to put no surname. Susan, rousing herself from contemplation, said vaguely. It's quite difficult sometimes with people just using Christian names. I got a postcard the other day signed Joan. I counted up I knew eight Jones, and with telephoning so much, one often doesn't know their handwriting. Miss Gilchrist was happily going over the possible Johns and Marys of her acquaintance. It might be Dorothy's daughter. Her name was Mary, but I hadn't heard of an engagement, still less of a marriage. Then there's little John Banfield, 
I suppose he's grown up and old enough to be married, or the Enfield girl. No, her name was Margaret. No address or anything. Oh, well, I dare say it will come to me. She picked up the tray and went out to the kitchen. Susan roused herself and said, Well, I suppose I'd better go and put the car somewhere. 10. Susan retrieved the car from the quarry where she had left it and drove it into the village. There was a petrol pump but no garage, and she was advised to take it to the King's Arms. They had room for it there, and she left it by a big Daimler which was preparing to go out. It was chauffeur-driven and inside it, very much muffled up, was an elderly foreign gentleman with a large mustache. The boy to whom Susan was talking about the car was staring at her with such rapt attention that he did not seem to be taking in half of what she said. Finally he said in an awe-stricken voice, You're her niece, aren't you? What? You're the victim's niece, the boy repeated with relish. Oh, yes, yes, I am. A.R. Wondered where I'd seen you before. Cool, thought Susan as she retraced her steps to the cottage. Miss Gilchrist greeted her with, Oh, you're safely back, in tones of relief which further annoyed her. Miss Gilchrist added anxiously, You can eat spaghetti, can't you? I thought for tonight. Oh, yes, anything. I don't want much. I really flatter myself that I can make a very tasty spaghetti au gratin. The boast was not an idle one. Miss Gilchrist, Susan reflected, was really an excellent cook. Susan offered to help wash up but Miss Gilchrist, though clearly gratified by the offer, assured Susan that there was very little to do. She came in a little while after with coffee. The coffee was less excellent, being decidedly weak. Miss Gilchrist offered Susan a piece of the wedding cake which Susan refused. It's really very good cake. Miss Gilchrist insisted, tasting it. She had settled to her own satisfaction that it must have been sent by someone whom she alluded to as Dear Ellen's daughter who I know was engaged to be married but I can't remember her name. Susan let Miss Gilchrist chirp away into silence before starting her own subject of conversation. This moment, after supper, sitting before the fire, was a companionable one. She said at last, My Uncle Richard came down here before he died, didn't he? Yes, he did. When was that exactly? Let me see, it must have been one, two, nearly three weeks before his death was announced. Did he see him ill? Well, no, I wouldn't say he seemed exactly ill. He had a very hearty, vigorous manner. Mrs. Lanskinet was very surprised to see him. She said, well, really, Richard, after all these years, and he said, I came to see for myself exactly how things are with you. And Mrs. Lanskinet said, I'm all right. I think, you know, she was a teeny bit offended by his turning up so casually, after the long break. Anyway, Mr. Abernethy said, no use keeping up old grievances. You and I and Timothy are the only ones left, and nobody can talk to Timothy except about his own health. And he said, Pierre seems to have made you happy, so it seems I was in the wrong. There, will that content you? Very nicely, he said it. A handsome man, though elderly, of course. How long was he here? He stayed for lunch. Beef olives I made. Fortunately it was the day the butcher called. Miss Gilchrist's memory seemed to be almost wholly culinary. They seemed to be getting on well together? Oh, yes. Susan paused and then said, Was Aunt Cora surprised when he died? Oh, yes, it was quite sudden, wasn't it? Yes, it was sudden. I mean, she was surprised. He hadn't given her any indication how ill he was. Oh, I see what you mean. Miss Gilchrist paused a moment. No, no, I think perhaps you are right. She did say that he had got very old. I think she said senile. But you didn't think he was senile? Well, not to look at. But I didn't talk to him much. Naturally, I left them alone together. Susan looked at Miss Gilchrist speculatively. Was Miss Gilchrist the kind of woman who listened at doors? She was honest, Susan felt sure, she wouldn't ever pilfer, or cheat over the housekeeping, or open letters. But inquisitiveness can drape itself in a mantle of rectitude. Miss Gilchrist might have found it necessary to garden near an open window, or to dust the hall. 
that would be within the permitted lengths. And then, of course, she could not have helped hearing something. You didn't hear any of their conversation? Susan asked. Too abrupt. Miss Gilchrist flushed angrily. No, indeed, Mrs. Banks. It has never been my custom to listen at doors. That means she does, thought Susan. Otherwise she'd just say. No. Aloud she said. I'm so sorry, Miss Gilchrist. I didn't mean it that way. But sometimes, in these small flimsily built cottages, one simply can't help overhearing nearly everything that goes on. And now that they are both dead, it's really rather important to the family to know just what was said at that meeting between them. The cottage was anything but flimsily built. It dated from a sturdier era of building. But Miss Gilchrist accepted the bait and rose to the suggestion held out. Of course what you say is quite true, Mrs. Banks. This is a very small place, and I do appreciate that you would want to know what passed between them, but really I'm afraid I can't help very much. I think they were talking about Mr. Abernethy's health, and certain, well, fancies he had. He didn't look it, but he must have been a sick man, and as is so often the case, he put his ill health down to outside agencies. A common symptom, I believe. My aunt. Miss Gilchrist described her aunt. Susan, like Mr. Entwistle, sidetracked the aunt. Yes, she said. That is just what we thought. My uncle's servants were all very attached to him, and naturally they are upset by his thinking. She paused. Oh, of course. Servants are very touchy about anything of that kind. I remember that my aunt. Again Susan interrupted. It was the servants he suspected, I suppose. Of poisoning him, I mean. I don't know. I really. Susan noted her confusion. It wasn't the servants. Was it one particular person? I don't know, Mrs. Banks. Really, I don't know. But her eye avoided Susan's. Susan thought to herself that Miss Gilchrist knew more than she was willing to admit. It was possible that Miss Gilchrist knew a good deal. Deciding not to press the point for the moment, Susan said, What are your own plans for the future, Miss Gilchrist? Well, really, I was going to speak to you about that, Mrs. Banks. I told Mr. Entwistle I would be willing to stay on until everything here was cleared up. I know. I'm very grateful. And I wanted to ask you how long that was likely to be, because, of course... I must start looking about for another post. Susan considered. There's really not very much to be done here. In a couple of days I can get things sorted out and notify the auctioneer. You have decided to sell up everything then? Yes. I don't suppose there will be any difficulty in letting the cottage? Oh no, people will queue up for it, I'm sure. There are so few cottages to rent. One nearly always has to buy. So it's all very simple, you see. Susan hesitated a moment before saying, I wanted to tell you that I hope you'll accept three months' salary. That's very generous of you, I'm sure, Mrs. Banks. I do appreciate it. And you would be prepared to, I mean I could ask you, if necessary, to, to recommend me? To say that I had been with a relation of yours and that I had, proved satisfactory? Oh, of course. I don't know whether I ought to ask it. Miss Gilchrist's hands began to shake, and she tried to steady her voice. But would it be possible not to, to mention the circumstances, or even the name? Susan stared. I don't understand. That's because you haven't thought, Mrs. Banks. It's murder. A murder that's been in the papers and that everybody has read about. Don't you see? People might think two women living together, and one of them is killed and perhaps the companion did it. Don't you see, Mrs. Banks? I'm sure that if I was looking for someone I'd, well, I'd think twice before engaging myself, if you understand what I mean. Because one never knows. It's been worrying me dreadfully, Mrs. Banks. I've been lying awake at night thinking that perhaps I'll never get another job, not of this kind. And what else is there that I can do? The question came out with unconscious pathos. Susan felt suddenly stricken. She realized the desperation of this pleasant-spoken commonplace woman who was dependent for existence on the fears and whims of employers. And there was a lot of truth in what Miss Gilchrist had said. You wouldn't, if you could help it, 
engage a woman to share domestic intimacy who had figured, however innocently, in a murder case. Susan said, but if they find the man who did it, oh then, of course, it will be quite all right. But will they find him? I don't think myself, the police have the least idea. And if he's not caught, well, that leaves me as, as not quite the most likely person, but as a person who could have done it. Susan nodded thoughtfully. It was true that Miss Gilchrist did not benefit from Cora Lansconet's death. But who was to know that? And besides, there were so many tales, ugly tales, of animosity arising between women who lived together, strange pathological motives for sudden violence. Someone who had not known them might imagine that Cora Lansconet and Miss Gilchrist had lived on those terms. Susan spoke with her usual decision. Don't worry, Miss Gilchrist she said, speaking briskly and cheerfully. I'm sure I can find you a post amongst my friends. There won't be the least difficulty. I'm afraid, said Miss Gilchrist, regaining some of her customary manner, that I couldn't undertake any really rough work. Just a little plain cooking and housework. The telephone rang and Miss Gilchrist jumped. Dear me, I wonder who that can be. I expect it's my husband, said Susan, jumping up. He said he'd ring me tonight. She went to the telephone. Yes, yes, this is Mrs. Banks speaking personally. There was a pause and then her voice changed. It became soft and warm. Hello, darling, yes, it's me. Oh, quite well. Murder by someone unknown, the usual thing. Only Mr. Entwistle. What? It's difficult to say, but I think so. Yes, just as we thought. Absolutely according to plan. I shall sell the stuff. There's nothing we'd want. Not for a day or two. Absolutely frightful. Don't fuss. I know what I'm doing. Greg, you didn't. You we. Be careful too. No, it's nothing. Nothing at all. Good night, darling. She rang off. The nearness of Miss Gilchrist had hampered her a little. Miss Gilchrist could probably hear from the kitchen, where she had tactfully retired, exactly what went on. There were things she had wanted to ask Greg, but she hadn't liked to. She stood by the telephone, frowning abstractedly. Then suddenly an idea came to her. Of course, she murmured. Just the thing. Lifting the receiver she asked for trunk inquiry. Some quarter of an hour later a weary voice from the exchange was saying, I'm afraid there's no reply. Please go on ringing them. Susan spoke autocratically. She listened to the far-off buzzing of a telephone bell. Then, suddenly it was interrupted and a man's voice, peevish and slightly indignant, said, Yes, yes, what is it? Uncle Timothy? What's that? I can't hear you. Uncle Timothy? I'm Susan Banks. Susan who? Banks. Formerly Abernethy. Your niece Susan. Oh, you're Susan, are you? What's the matter? What are you ringing up for at this time of night? It's quite early still. It isn't. I was in bed. You must go to bed very early. How's Aunt Maud? Is that all you rang up to ask? Your aunt's in a good deal of pain, and she can't do a thing. Not a thing. She's helpless. We're in a nice mess, I can tell you. That fool of a doctor says he can't even get a nurse. He wanted to cart Maud off to hospital. I stood out against that. He's trying to get hold of someone for us. I can't do anything. I daren't even try. There's a fool from the village staying in the house tonight, but she's murmuring about getting back to her husband. Don't know what we're going to do. That's what I rang up about. Would you like Miss Gilchrist? Who's she? Never heard of her. Aunt Cora's companion. She's very nice and capable. Can she cook? Yes, she cooks very well, and she could look after Aunt Maud. That's all very well, but when could she come? Here I am, all on my own, with only these idiots of village women popping in and out at odd hours, and it's not good for me. My heart's playing me up. I'll arrange for her to get off to you as soon as possible. The day after tomorrow, perhaps? Well, thanks very much, said the voice rather grudgingly. You're a good girl, Susan, er, thank you. 
Susan rang off and went into the kitchen. Would you be willing to go up to Yorkshire and look after my aunt? She fell and broke her ankle and my uncle is quite useless. He's a bit of a pest but Aunt Maud is a very good sort. They have help in from the village, but you could cook and look after Aunt Maud. Miss Gilchrist dropped the coffee pot in her agitation. Oh, thank you, thank you, that really is kind. I think I can say of myself that I am really good in the sick room, and I'm sure I can manage your uncle and cook him nice little meals. It's really very kind of you, Mrs. Banks, and I do appreciate it.